All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of our Careers in Marine Science and Ocean Conservation series. Uh, my name is Robin Ehrlich. I'm the Education Manager at Pacific Whale Foundation. Um, today, I've got Florence Sullivan here with me, our research analyst. Um, and this series, I'm hoping, is a fun way for everybody to get to know some of our team members in a different way. Um, so we often get to meet team members and find out about what they currently do. Um, but not so much the pathway that got them to where they are. And I know a lot of people that come in contact with Pacific Whale Foundation or Pack Whale Eco Adventures um, are often inspired to work with us and wonder what it takes to get to a position like this. Um, and a lot of our team members have these really interesting career journeys that got them to where they are. Um, and so I hope this is interesting and inspiring for everybody to learn about. Um, so, and we've all kind of started from some pretty unique career goals as children. Um, and Florence certainly has a unique story. So I want to introduce Florence Sullivan and let her tell us a little bit about herself. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I have made a little PowerPoint with lots of photos that hopefully won't be too embarrassing uh, to help share my story. Um, thanks, Robin, for the lovely introduction. As she said, my name is Florence Sullivan. Um, I have had, uh, what, sorry, let me gather my thoughts here. <laughs> What's really cool about this series of webinars that Robin's put together is once you start talking to those of us in the field, you realize no one has had a straight path. Um, no one knows exactly how they're going to get to where they're going or, um, and, uh, as you can see on this slide here, I've got a couple of different career fields that I sort of consider myself part of. Uh, I started as an oceanographer. Um, I have spent time as a marine spatial ecologist. Um, and let's break those big words down for a second. Marine means everything related to the ocean, right? Spatial is how things move through space. And ecology is the big puzzle of how the world goes together, right? So as a marine spatial ecologist, it means that I am interested in how animals move, particularly ocean animals, move through space and how they're related to the ocean at large, right? And now at the Pacific Whale Foundation, I'm currently the research analyst and I spend a lot of my time uh, processing data and working with the numbers that help us uh, understand the puzzle of our world right now. So I didn't do this alone. And the person, animal, who really got me started on this journey and that everyone in my family agrees uh, is my research assistant, Celie. Now I was very clever, you know, uh, when I was a child and his name is Celie because he is a seal. So forgive me for my naming. <laughs> <laughs> but there we go. And uh, Celie is here with us today. So there you go. He's still around. Now, uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, my mom who tracked down a bunch of photos of the early days of Celie and Florence to help me tell this story. Thanks, mom. Um, so Celie and I started when I was two days old. Seely was a gift from a great aunt. Um, and the earliest record in photos that we could find was at six months old. He was a lot fluffier then. And your <laughs> color a little? <laughs> and a little bit lighter, not quite as gray. <laughs> um, and so he was there in my crib. And he's starting to get a little shabbier by the time I turned two years old and my little brother arrives. And of course, my brother had to be introduced to Seely immediately. Um, and just to tell you how important this seal was, like, look, he's in my arms at a picnic. He doesn't even get to be put down for the important act of eating and of snacking and of, uh, you know, having sustenance. So that's probably why he's no longer as white as he once was, was because he's been dragged through everything. So fast forward till I'm five years old, I'm in preschool, 
this is the precious box. This is show and tell where you were supposed to show the most precious thing to you, to your, all of your classmates, um, and to, to really share something special. So of course, the first thing in the box is Celie, right? This is who I'm going to share with the group. So at this point, um, I think it's really astonishing how early on our passions can be established. Um, and at this point, most of my children's books were showing me that seals and sea lions, they're at the circus, right? So I was like, all right, if I want to spend time and if I want to have a job uh, with real seals, then I have to go to the circus, right? So that was the first career goal that I personally remember was I want to spend time with seals, therefore I have to be in the circus. Very logical. Right? Very logical, right? So turns out that's not the only place that seals exist. When I was in fourth grade, uh, we saw a film in class that had these really cool people in red wetsuits uh, that were going out in California and finding seals and sea lions that were entangled in fishing nets and cutting them free. Uh, and and cutting them loose and rescuing them. And I thought, mind blown, that was the coolest possible job and obviously the best way that I could spend the rest of my life because not only would I be working with seals, I would be making their life better, right? Cool. So that was the first major career switch uh, from running away to the circus to working uh, in marine mammal rescue. And that was fourth grade that you discovered that? That was fourth grade, yeah. It was a, a film in class, you know, they rolled the big TV in, the VHS <laughs> machine on the, the rolly stand, and they shut all the lights off, and, you know, probably most of my classmates fell asleep because it was warm and sunny, but there were seals on the screen, so I paid attention. <laughs> of course. Of course. So, there we go. Oh, um, real quick, I apologize. I no always worries. forget to mention something at the beginning, whether it's introducing myself or something else. I know I got that one this time, but I forgot to mention, for those of you joining us, if you have questions for Florence or Seely, um, you can ask those which, whichever way you prefer. We've got the chat in here. We've got the Q&A um, for those that are with us live right now. Um, and you can also raise your hand if you'd like to speak and actually ask a question to Florence or Seely. So please keep that in mind and we'll make sure we get to your questions as soon as we can. Sorry about that, Florence. That's perfectly fine. It just gives you more time to admire my extensive seal collection, right? So most of my family had cottoned on to the fact that I was quite obsessed with seals. Uh, and therefore, as many of you who have ever enjoyed a particular thing, maybe your family decided that you liked small figurines. Maybe you liked dolls. Maybe you liked dolphins. It turns out when you like a thing, your family tends to give you that thing as a present for every possible occasion. And it's the best. It's so great. So by the time I was 10 years old, I had written a couple of reports for my science fair and collected a bunch of seal figurines and really started to try and understand how cool were seals and find all the neat facts that I could about them. And my local library had this awesome uh, thing where for uh, a month, if you had a collection of something, you could display your collection at the library. Yeah, and it would rotate every month. And anyone from the community could say, I have a thing that I want to share, and I'm going to put it up. So this is my collection of seals with my little fourth or fifth grade science report about seals um, hanging at my local library. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um, so at this point, well established, I'm obsessed with seals and I want to work in seal re rescue and rehabilitation. Okay. So I figured I have to know what to do, right? And I come from Seattle uh, and Seattle has a world-class aquarium at Pier 59 and they have a really great teen volunteer program. 
So I was so excited about this program and I bugged them so much that normally you're not allowed to go in until to, to participate until you're 16 years old, right? Now, my birthday's in May and I managed to argue my way in by saying, hey, I am a sophomore in high school. I should be allowed to join even if I'm not 16 yet because your training is in December and I don't wanna have to wait until next year, December, to be able to start volunteering. <laughs> I am too excited. So I argued my way in um, and I spent the next four years. Uh, the minimum for the program is coming in twice a month for a four hour shift, I believe. They may have changed that. Um, I spent most weekends at the aquarium <laughs> for as long as I possibly could. And that was a really cool program because it taught me how to be uh, confident in, in speaking to the public. Um, it taught me how to say, I don't know, and be okay with not knowing when the public has a question for me. Right? This is the basis of research. It's figuring out what you don't know and being willing to go find the answer. That's a right? really great point. It is a good point. So, so recognizing that when someone asks you a question that you don't know, you don't need to make up an answer to sound smarter. You can say, I don't know. Let's go find out together. And that's how great things start, right? Amazing that you so, learned that in high school. It takes a lot of people a long time to learn that. <laughs> yeah, it's a really great program. They, they do a lot of mentorship. Um, and you get to hang out with all of the fishes and the marine mammals and really cool people all the time. Um, they have a, a beach naturalist program in the summertime where you can go down to the low tide and interact with people who are just walking the beach and teach them about the organisms that they're going to find on the beach. Um, and that was a really port, uh, you know, formative part of my um, high school experience. How did you find out about that? Was that just because you had visited the aquarium before, obviously? <laughs> I had visited the aquarium before, <laughs> yes. um, but also there was a volunteer fair at my high school. We all had um, volunteer program, uh, sorry, uh, projects that we had to complete as part uh, as a service requirement. Um, and so the, I think I sort of knew that you could be a volunteer at the aquarium. I'm not sure that I knew that as a teen I could do that until they had a table at the volunteer fair at my high school. So, okay. Yeah. So that was a big part of high school. And, uh, and then I graduated and went to college and got to live my dream. The summer after my freshman year at college, uh, my grandmother, we were going to visit her for the summer. And she said, I found a thing for you to do while you're visiting me this summer there's a seal rehabilitation clinic not far. And she emailed them and she called and she found out about the volunteer program there. And she was like, you need my granddaughter to come, <laughs> you know, as grandmothers are want to do. Uh, and it was the best thing. So here on the screen, on the left side here, this is CP and this is Kai. These are uh, two of the rescued baby harbor seals that I got to help nurse back to health. And this is the first time that I got to hand feed them a fish. They had finally been weaned off of the fish slurry that, that uh, was helping them uh, put on weight. And up in the top corner, we have some other seals that are well on their way to being rehabilitated. Uh, and I am scooping fish out of the pool for them because you can't leave fish in the pool too long otherwise it will um, start to have bacteria um, and that could be not great for the the seals and then down in the right hand side is being able to release the seal pups once they're all healthy That's gotta be the best part. so I spent two and a half months uh, at the Zeehond de Krish in the Netherlands uh, helping to rehabilitate seals and it was a dream come true I met some fabulous people. I learned a lot of things. But I also learned that it turns out rescuing seals means cleaning a lot of poop. And 
three quarters of the job was sanitizing and cleaning the rooms and um, yeah, doing lots and lots of laundry. <laughs> the stuff no one tells you about. The stuff no one tells you about. <laughs> and I had already started going to college and it became evident to me that A, I wasn't, I loved seals but I wasn't fond of the idea of doing laundry and cleaning poop for the rest of my life. Uh, that the program I was in was not a veterinary program, which would be the other way of getting in uh, and doing more with the seals that had more to do with caring and less to do with cleaning up all the poop. Um, so I was a little bit lost, you know? Um, I, I had to completely rethink what I wanted to do once I realized that this was not my career path anymore. Uh, and I had to reinvent myself. Um, so what did I do? I threw myself into my undergraduate program at the University of Washington in Seattle. I was in the oceanography program. And I went out to sea. Right now, oceanography is the study of the ocean, and to get started here, you have to know the biology, the geology, the physics, the chemistry, and you have to take calculus and do a bunch of math. The other things that they don't always tell you, right? The other things that they don't always tell you before they even let you take the classes about how all of those things work in the ocean, right? So it's a very science heavy degree. Um, and in high school, I had taken as many science classes as I could because I knew that that was going to be important. Uh, but this rammed it home even further, right? So I dove into the science. And as soon as I got out on the boats, I was like, this, this is amazing. Because I'm out in the ocean uh, and I'm starting to understand the place that the seals live and all of the things that go into their environment, right? Um, so while I was at the University of Washington, I sailed primarily in the Puget Sound uh, and in this area of the North Pacific Ocean aboard the Thomas G. Thompson, which is this beautiful 300 foot vessel right here. Um, and my senior thesis project actually was the first time that I came to Hawaii, the first and only time before this job. Down here, we came and sailed uh, around the main Hawaiian islands and took a bunch of water samples. And I looked at, get this, the viruses and bacteria in ocean water. And I was interested in the ratio of how many viruses there are compared to how many bacteria as you go down in the water column deeper and deeper and deeper, right? Now, there's less of them, short, long story short. People might want to know, although if you think about what that means for not so deep where we are. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Most of these viruses are very, very small and not going to mess with our systems. But uh, what was really neat was because we were in Hawaii, we had the chance to sample in a hydrothermal vent plume. So at the Loihi volcano, which is going to be the newest Hawaiian island in volcanic time uh, once it finally breaks the surface. There's a lot more bacteria and a lot more viruses down there where there's warm water than, uh, than there are other places that are deeper in the ocean, okay. which was pretty cool to find out. Come a long way from seals. A long way from seals, right? I went all the way back to the beginning of the food chain. <laughs> it's the way I like to think about it. Okay? Yeah. So, after university, I ended up getting a job with uh, NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Juneau, Alaska, uh, continuing this oceanographic journey. And I spent time um, taking water samples in the Bering Sea, which is circled on this map, uh, because we were looking at the conditions that the salmon and the pollock and the Pacific cod were growing up in, in the Bering Sea. Because if you know what temperature the water is, uh, how much food, so how much chlorophyll A, how much primary production there is happening in the water right there, um, 
how much oxygen there is in the water and how big the fish are when they're babies. So age zero, having just been born that year and how healthy they are. You can plug all that information into forecasting models and have an idea of how many fish are going to survive and be adults and be healthy uh, three or five years in the future and start to get an idea of how many fish it will be safe to take out of the ocean for us to all eat. Right, and this is part of the work that makes the Alaskan fisheries so sustainable. So I was a very tiny cog in a very large machine, but it was still pretty cool because it meant I got to spend three summers in the Bering Sea uh, on board the Oscar Dyson, which is the ship that is in this picture here. Very cool. So that was all really awesome. But you may be asking yourself, well, where was Seely during all of this? Uh, oh, wait, first some photos of what it means to do oceanography. I so, know one of the people in one of your pictures. No way. Lindsay. Lindsay, <laughs> you know Lindsay. That's I fabulous. Do. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so um, on the, the left hand side here, this is what we call uh, a Niskin rosette. These big, long gray tubes uh, are 10 liter water bottles, essentially, that we can close at different depths in the water column to grab water from different parts of the uh, water column to test for, again, the temperature, the oxygen, the chlorophyll, um, various other metrics that we are interested in as oceanographers. Um, this machine on the right hand side uh, is a filtration setup so that we can gather all of the tiny little particulate matter that is um, the phytoplankton and the zooplankton, all the growing things that form the base of the food web uh, are onto these little filters so that we can measure how much of it there is. And uh, this was also a fisheries survey. So down in the bottom is my awesome team of women scientists who had just had a uh, fishnet come up full of jellyfish instead of the fish that we were looking for. So. We were like, hooray, here's another, another ton of jellyfish that we get to process. But jellyfish it was good. So cool. They are super cool. Absolutely. So we had to measure and weigh 50 of these each time one of them, each time a net came up so that we could get an idea of the distribution of how big jellyfish are in the Bering Sea. Turned into a whole different project. <laughs> so, all right, now you're wondering where was Seely? Seely was here the entire time. Okay, this is one of the times that we did catch fish and Celia was very excited for a snack uh, to happen while, um, while we measured and took scale samples and took the otoliths, which is the ear bone of the fish to see how old they were uh, and all sorts of other things, right? Celia also really enjoyed learning how to, drive, how to navigate the ship and charting our course on the maps uh, up on the bridge of the vessel. Um, he enjoyed driving the boat. Especially important is the mess hall when you're at sea. Three square meals a day is no joke, right? Notice that there's bungee cords on everything so that when your ship goes sideways because of the swell, your plates don't all fall and shatter. So those are good things to know. Seely helped to take water samples uh, at different depths. So you can see there's a two here for that's when we were taking water at two meters and at 10 meters uh, and at 20 meters down here and so on and so forth. And then after he had filtered all of the chlorophyll and primary productivity onto those little filters, he would run it through these machines to measure how much of it there was and his penmanship is very good, making sure that everything was recorded. Because remember, it's not science unless you write it down, right? Experimenting is great, but if you don't keep a record, then you don't know what you've already done. So, gotta keep a record. Uh, he particularly liked operating the winch in order to bring the CTD up and down in the water column so that we could get the, uh, the water samples, yeah. He likes to play with all the toys. Oops, go back. How do I go back? While we're, while we're we backing up, Ella has a great question, and this is important for a lot of people considering these careers. 
Yes. Um, you mentioned all the seal poop that no one told you about working with seals. So if she wants to work with whales, is she gonna have to pick up whale poop? Well, some people do, and it's actually really cool. <laughs> So Ella, um, once we get to my graduate work, I have a friend who just defended her PhD, Dr. Layla Lemos, and her whole thing is collecting gray whale poop on the, co uh, the coast of Oregon so that she can measure how stressed the animals are, whether they um, are male or female. Tell, she can tell if they're pregnant or not, depending on the hormones in their poop, um, and she can see what they've eaten recently, right? And we can do the same thing with seals uh, and other pinnipeds. Um, collecting poop is actually a whole nother subset of science that is very cool. It's just also very smelly. Good point. On that yes. note, follow up question from Ella. How do whales poop? How do whales poop? Um, have you ever thought about how you poop, Ella? Um, it's not something I really think about. I just do it, right? Like I know when I have to poop and I go to the toilet. Yeah. Um, I think it's the same for whales as well, only they don't have to find a toilet. They've got the whole ocean. So they just go. Um, it looks kind of different um, for different whale species and it, it'll be different colors depending on what they're eating. Um, and it'll be, it will be different um, like consistencies depending on if they're eating, uh, what they're eating as well. Um, for gray whales, at least, which is where I have the most experience, there's, uh, it's, it's pretty much like a cloud of red. Um, and I know that for the orca whales in the Puget Sound, there are actually dogs that are trained as poops, poop sniffers um, that help the researchers find the orcas where they poop so that the researchers can grab the poop and then go and do experiments with it to find out what the whales have been eating and how healthy they are. So if you like dogs and you like whales, one career choice potentially is to be a person who trains dogs to sniff whale poop. Who knew there were so many careers just related to whale poop? Yeah, But totally. on the other side of that, of course, it's a choice. So if you wanna work with whales and you don't like poop, probably That okay. is okay. There are other things that you can do with whales that don't involve sampling whale poop. I yeah. <laughs> so the next boat that I went on uh, is the Akademik Fedorov here, uh, and this was part of the Nansen Amundsen Basin Observation Systems Cruise. And here I got to sail in the Barents Sea, the Kara Sea, uh, the Laptev Sea, um, and this photo down uh, up, up at the top is when Celia and I got to go and help sample an ice flow. So we got to drill down and see how thick the Arctic ice is. So that's me standing on the Arctic Ocean. And then down at the bottom is a photo of Celia and I as far north as we had ever gotten before, which was within five degrees of the North Pole. So five degrees, we're, we're talking, you know, latitude, longitude. Can you see it from where you are? And is it in fact something to see? Um, I could not see it from where I was. Uh, and it's not really something to see. Uh, I believe they sometimes try and plant a flag, but because the ice moves, then the flag also moves, right? Even though the North Pole uh, doesn't so much. Although if you get into real science, you'll know why I'm wrong when, when I'm saying that. <laughs> It'll be a debate for another time. But yeah, that's, that's a debate for another issue. And I'm, no I'm aware of it. North Pole. So uh, this project was to, again, measure the oceanography of, uh, of these different basins in the Arctic Ocean and to look at how, uh, how currents were moving through the area uh, and looking particularly at sea ice. So that was very cool. And that's as far north as Celia and I has, have gotten. And one thing that I will always remember is that when I came home from this trip, my mom said something along the lines of, you know, I'm going to stop doubting the things that you're telling me you're going to do. Uh, because as a parent, you know, she's concerned. She's like, oh, honey, do you really think that you can do those things? It's very difficult to get there. Um, and she says, I'm going to stop doubting because 
you said you wanted to go to the Arctic Ocean and you've gone to the Arctic Ocean. So if you tell me that you want to go to the Antarctica, which I do, you'll probably get there too. <laughs> and that's always a really nice thing to hear from your parents or from people who are important to you, you know, is for them to recognize that, hey, the things you want to do are difficult, but you have the passion to do them and you're going to make it happen. So let us support you. Absolutely. Um, so after that project, I realized that I wanted to go back to school. And I picked Oregon State University because they had uh, specifically a marine mammal research program. Uh, and so this is really where I started transitioning away from oceanography uh, and looking at the baseline of the food web and the, the underpinnings of the ocean ecosystem and started coming back towards marine mammals. Um, so this, these are photos of my research project, which was to look at uh, gray whale foraging ecology. So how do gray whales find their food and how do their behavior change uh, based on whether, uh, how much food is available and whether or not there are vessels around, right? So the main tool that we were using is here uh, on the yellow tripod in the upper right hand corner. This is called a theodolite and it measures angles. And it's a tool that you often uh, hear uh, marine mammal folks talk about. Funny thing is, it's actually an architecture tool. It was developed, you see it on the side of the highway sometimes, or at construction sites, because it measures angles and uh, architects use it to make sure that the road is going straight, right? And marine mammal folks have totally co-opted it and changed uh, how it's used to fit the questions that we're asking, right? So if you know exactly where you are, it uses the Pythagorean theorem to draw a straight line down to where the ocean is, and then it uses the angle of the telescope to, um, to use the angle, or side angle side property uh, to measure the hypotenuse. So it all comes down to triangles and geometry and things you haven't thought about since high school. And it can measure exactly where the whale is, or it can make a point in space using the laptop that does all the nice math for us. The poor researchers back before laptops had to do all the calculations by hand, right? Now I just give the signal to the laptop and it does the math for me, which is great. <laughs> But so if I make a point, a fix, a location, every single time that the whale comes to the surface, then all of a sudden I can create track lines, maps of where the whale has been, how much time it took to get from point A to point B, um, and, and how it got there, right? So here's a map of the study area that uh, was shown. This is on the, co the southern coast of Oregon. The yellow star is where our theodolite setup was as well as my other interns who were taking photos and tracking with just binoculars. The green dots uh, are the kelp patches and all of the black dots are where the whales were coming to the surface, right? So this is all, all the whales for the entire summer season of 2016. Um, so this wasn't all happening at once because that would be bad, right? But notice how this one right here, it's pretty much a straight line. And there, you can see some patterns that there's kind of like a highway developing of the whales coming very close along the shoreline and really sticking to those kelp patches. And that is exactly what we found. That in order for a whale to start, look, to start foraging, so start eating, there had to be a certain density, a certain amount of food available um, and be in the general area. And then to find the specific little patches of food that it was gonna eat, the whales really used the kelp patches and they would go right from one kelp patch to another and they wouldn't spend very much time at all in between the kelp patches. Um, yeah. So, so that was really neat to find out. And then also we found out that if there were um, boats around, if there was food, the food was more important. But if the whale hadn't found food yet, then it would keep traveling, keep searching if there were boats in the area, 
because at that point, if it didn't already have food, then um, it wasn't worth the extra stress to be looking for food while it was around folks. Interesting. Yeah, so that was my, um, my thesis work, basically. Um, and come on, next slide. I had a bunch of interns who helped me with that, and we measured the, uh, the amount of food available with a GoPro and a plankton net and an awesome research kayak because we were very close to shore. Um, and so that was, that was pretty neat to be able to kayak for work and for school. Definitely. Before we get too far from the, the data that you just showed, and I don't know if you want to put it back, Shelby has a question. Um, yeah. She said, it looks like a couple whales did their own thing. Um, what might those outliers be about? So those lines you pointed out that go- These ones here? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so that could have been uh, due to, so what's not shown on the map is that there's another area down here below. Uh, you can sort of start to see some, some whales coming down here. It was past the point where our theodolite could measure, but we know that there was some areas down here. So the whales could have um, started uh, heading for one thing and then changed their mind. Uh, also, it could be due to the tide or what was available on that day, uh, because this, all these black dots uh, span about two and a half months. Um, and so this is all one whale. This is definitely all one whale. Um, and so on those days, it's, simp it's likely that there were other whales in the area. These guys aren't super social on the foraging grounds. So if there was already a whale here, maybe this guy is moving over here to see if there's uh, not. Um, at the same time, we've also seen whales foraging in super close proximity. So I really can't say too much. There's a lot of different ways that you could try and interpret. Uh, what's fun about this kind of research is to uh, ask questions about the group as a whole, and then also be like, but why was this individual different? <laughs> and we can speculate. Um, but you know what would really help? Is if somebody would invent some way of asking the whales directly and of figuring out what the whales are saying. And they might then, not even know. Think about some of the things we do sometimes. That's true. That's true. Why did I go to um, that restaurant instead of this one? Or maybe it wanted uh, ice cream instead of cotton candy or something at the fair. I don't know. <laughs> I forget where I'm going sometimes. I start going one way for no reason. It's entirely possible. I like to think they're more intelligent than that, but <laughs> we all have our moments. We do. We, we do all have our moments. So there we go. Uh, yeah. So uh, after grad school, I spent a little bit of time as a marine mammal observer. And of course, Seeley was out there with me too. So logging how many different whales and dolphins and other species uh, were seen on various research trips. Um, and then it took me a while to be able to find a research job, actually. Uh, and so during my job search, I came across the Environmental Science Center in uh, Seahurst, Washington, Seattle, Washington, and uh, they very graciously allowed me to become part of their education team. And so here I would go into classrooms and teach um, K through eighth grade, um, depending on the season, intertidal ecology, so all of the critters that you're likely to find on the beach. Uh, or salmon ecology during the fall when we had the salmons coming up the rivers. Um, and I taught the kids how to interact with creatures respectfully on the beach uh, and to protect the environment, basically. Uh, and then we would take them out onto the beach and let them explore and see what there was to see. Uh, and it was really cool because we would bring we particularly served uh, a portion of the community that, even though they live very close to the Puget Sound, may never have come to the beach because uh, of transportation issues or because their families don't really know that it's okay uh, or whatnot. So for a lot of these kids, it was the first time they'd ever seen 
these creatures or experience the beach. And that was really, really exciting. And a whole other part of science, which is bringing the love that we have for these creatures and sharing that love and sharing the knowledge uh, with others so that more people care and more people do their part to, to conserve, basically. Absolutely. Um, and so this is where I was working when I uh, submitted my application and went through the interviews and got hired as the research oh. analyst for the Pacific Whale Foundation, which is where I am now and having quite a lot of fun. Uh, and yes, I did take a first day of work picture with Celie with a Hawaiian flower <laughs> because I was so excited. As you should. As I should. So this is where we are now. Uh, that's how Celie has really influenced the uh, entire trajectory of my life from day two of my existence. Um, and at this point, if you have more questions uh, or want to send me a message, there's my email. And if anyone has more questions or you do, then we're good to go. I definitely do. We can also see if any of our attendees do as well that are live and anyone that's not live can email Florence anytime with questions. Um, I always like to ask because we now definitely got to know your winding journey and it was definitely interesting from seals down to viruses and bacteria back to marine mammals, lots of math that people didn't consider. Um, and so what kind of advice would you have for somebody that wants to work in a, you know, marine science or conservation related field? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest piece of advice that I always give is to chase skill sets, not species, right? People didn't take me seriously when I would say, I love seals. I want to work with seals, right? But as soon as I started saying, I appreciate marine mammals, I want to work in the ocean, uh, I can do data management, I can run chlorophyll samples, I know how to operate a CTD, um, I know how to use Excel and word processing, I know how to communicate in public, I know how to, um, oh gosh, I know how to <laughs> process a fishing sample when we want to take otoliths and when we want to take scales and when we need to take measurements and lengths and I have good handwriting and all of these different skill sets that uh, are necessary to to be uh, a scientist, right? Like for this job specifically, I think the part that got me hired was that I can code, I can do computer coding now in R uh, is the language that I primarily use. And that allows me to make my research and the work that I'm doing reproducible so that I can um, if work with collaborators, work with partners and say, this is what I did here. If you do the same thing, we're gonna get the same answer. Uh, and that's really important, right? Being able to work with others, being able to work as part of a team, but also being able to work individually. It's all these like soft and hard skills combined, not what species you wanna apply them to, right? Um, one of the people that I really look up to who was a student with me started as an undergraduate in theater. Wow. And she has her PhD in marine mammal science now. Um, one of my professors started working, I think, with like bugs uh, or maybe it was some like prairie species. And then now she's a world expert in turtles, like sea turtles. Um, it's not the species that you start chasing. It's the skill sets that allow you to adapt between all the different sciences that you can apply. And so every internship, every volunteer opportunity, every job that you take should teach you at least one new skill set that even if it's not your end goal, it's going to get you closer to. Excellent advice and, and things that we don't think about a lot. The, the passion for that one species got you to where you are, but it really took kind of transition more on focusing what you can actually do with or for that species. 
or other things that you didn't know existed. I don't think you ever would have predicted you'd be studying viruses and bacteria. Oh, I had no idea. I didn't know that oceanography was a thing until like my senior year of high school and I was looking at colleges. Had oh, no yeah, that's, that's an important one to keep in mind too. And those experiences that you had, like you said, they should all teach you a new skill or something. Um, and finding those experiences, I think is good advice. And I just wanted to ask you, cause I don't, I think you mentioned for most of them, how many of those experiences you mentioned were volunteer or unpaid internships? Uh, the Seattle Aquarium was a, a volunteer position. The, um, the Zehon de Crush, the Seal Rehabilitation and Rescue Center was volunteer for two and a half months. Um, university uh, for my bachelor's was paid, right? You, you pay for your schooling there. Um, the first time that I went out to sea with NOAA um, up in Alaska, that was a volunteer opportunity my junior year of university. But the way that I acted and reacted to certain situations uh, and comported myself were directly related to me getting a job offer from them before I had even finished my degree. Um, and so that's how I was able to roll straight out of undergrad into uh, a contract position with NOAA. Um, and then the cruise up in the Arctic was a NSF, so National Science Foundation funded student opportunity. Um, so they paid for my plane ticket uh, and like my room and board on the boat, uh, but I didn't get paid for that but I also didn't have to pay for anything else. So it was kind of a sum zero. Um, I'm very fond of finding the loophole. I don't believe that you should have to pay for uh, higher education past a certain point. So uh, when I went to graduate school at Oregon State University, I didn't accept until I knew that I would be able to uh, pay my way with TA ships. So as a t I was a teaching assistant, I was a research assistant, uh, I was uh, an RA in the dorms so that I didn't have to pay for housing. Um, so I had a very small stipend, but it was enough uh, so that I don't have any debt from graduate school, which is really important. Very impressive. Um, so I would, another piece of advice I would tack on is don't go to graduate school unless you have A, a passion, you know what you're using your degree for, and they're paying you for it. Don't go into debt for it because this field is competitive and uh, it's very difficult to find a job. And when you do find the job, you're not making millions. <laughs> it's a labor of love. That's, that's really great advice. And I think it's always important to point out the the importance, I know I just said that a bunch of times, um, of those experiences prior to having jobs, a lot of those volunteer experiences that often lead to job opportunities and finding yeah. those. And I have to acknowledge that I come from a privileged place, right? I have a family that supported me. I had the people who, um, yeah, who supported me in my education, who allowed me the time in between jobs, in between experiences to just exist and live and like not charge me rent and to support me and uh, allow me to apply for these things. You know, not everyone can take the time for volunteer uh, opportunities and internships, um, but tr I guess don't lose hope if that's your story. Right, every single experience that you have can be turned into a skill set. Um, you just sometimes have to be creative about it. Absolutely, excellent advice, Florence. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think I see any other questions from anybody else here. Um, so I guess we'll start to wrap up again. If you have any questions, you can send them in real quick if you're live with us. If not, you can email those to Florence anytime. Her email is right here on the screen for you conveniently. It's her first name and last name at pacificwhale.org. Um, so with that, I want to thank you so much for joining us today to get to know Florence and her career journey. Um, we do have other career series interviews and other webinars you can find at pacificwhale.org slash events. Um, mahalo for joining us. Aloha. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>